Hey everyone, Doc T here with another podcast. Um, and this is going to be uh, two things that come from the Horse Advocate uh, Facebook page, some questions or comments that people put on. I just wanted to give a little bit more information uh, as to what that what they're asking and some of the, um, oh, what do you call it? Uh, just my thoughts, all right? Uh, so grab your pitchfork and start cleaning that stall or pay attention to those cars out on the interstate that are driving like crazy people and uh, always have an eye on them. Um, I'm going to grab my coffee mug. I hope you all can see this. It says, uh, I am my horse's advocate. The glare of this light kind of makes it. So I drink out of this every morning. Because I am my horse's advocate. And I hope you are too. If you're listening to this, you probably are. Becoming a horse's advocate is all about um, taking responsibility for the health and welfare of the animal that's in your care. Um, and it doesn't matter whether they're fish in your fish tank. I'm sorry to say this, but the plains in the garden, I know this is all about horses, but you know, when we start to put them under our care, we have a responsibility. And um, <laughs> I just... Uh, listen to this guy's little bit of a rant on YouTube that says uh, the right to repair. And the right to repair is a movement that he's starting that I found fascinating because I can relate to it so much. He says, a long time ago when you bought something, they gave you the schematics, they gave you the ability to find the parts, to replace the parts from your local electronics store and fix the motherboard that you had. Uh, to tweak the carburetor in your car, um, to repair the washing machine that's out there in the, in the garage. They gave you all the parts that you could get. You could get an independent repair person to come, come out there and repair these things. And he says, you can't do that anymore. When the battery dies in your phone or your computer or the keyboard doesn't work anymore or the chip uh, gets fried, uh, you've lost everything, including the data that's on your computer, the car that you've got. You, you have no idea. The dashboard isn't working. So do they go in there and fix the dashboard? No. It was back in uh, the late 90s. I was invited to Syracuse, New York, into the, um, the building that held uh, a telephone company called Cellular One. Cellular One isn't around anymore, but they were the first cellular phone company. And my client was the owner of that company, co-owner. He and his uh, uh, compadre had actually invented the cellular technology that turned into be the brick that they uh, bring around. And it, it was the size of a brick and you held it up to your face and it could transmit your voice over airwaves uh, to cell tower. That was the origins of Cellular One. And I own many cellular one phones. The first phone I had cost $1,800 and could bounce off one tower, maybe a couple of towers within a very small geographical range. And then if I went out of that range and went into another range, like I was based in Ithaca, New York. And if I went from Ithaca North into Syracuse, there's a whole section where I had no cell signal at all. And then when I went to Syracuse, I was roaming and I had to pay exorbitant roaming fees. So this $1,800 uh, phone that I had called a cell phone that was mounted in my vehicle permanently attached and was a full three watts, which is like, I don't know, 10 or 100 times more wattage than what we have in our cell phones now. I was able to reach out and touch these um, towers that were strategically placed around the county. And as soon as we went out of there, we went into a roaming territory. And I was paying $1,200 a month just for my phone bill. And there was a time where I actually had two phones in my car. Um, one was a radio telephone that I picked up and I had to push a button and say, Ithaca 537. <clears throat> and I'd wait and wait and wait. And finally, the Ithaca mobile operator would say, Ithaca mobile operator, go ahead, 537. I said, hey, good morning, Sue. How are you doing? She says, great, Doc. Who do you want to talk to? Your wife? And I said, yeah, pass me through. And she would, you know, make the magic happen down the call center and my call would be passed from my moving car to one tower near Ithaca and it would bounce back off to my wife's phone. And that's how I communicate with clients. I had that up to my one ear 
And then my other year, I had my brand new cell phone where I was talking to somebody else. And I actually had two phones up to my ear while I was driving, steering with my knee. But that's a whole different story. Sorry. Um, I didn't admit that. That's all fiction, right? Anyway, um, and the local radio uh, DJ actually saw me. I must have drove by him. And the next day, I'm listening to WTKO in Ithaca. And the morning DJ was just fit to be tied. He says, this is ridiculous. I mean, these mobile phones are bad, but you know, you won't believe it. But I saw a guy with two phones up to his ear and I felt like I was a local celebrity. He didn't call me out probably because he didn't know who I was because I just was in passing. But I'll never forget that day that he called me out as a two phone driver that he thought was ridiculous. Now, every one of us has at least one cell phone. We have one for every member in our family. And some of us have two, a work phone and a, and a private phone. Um, and we talk to people around the world. I'll go be doing 80 miles an hour, pardon me, 70 miles an hour, down, sorry, down the interstate. And um, I'll talk to my son who lives on the other side of the planet as clearly as I'm talking to you guys. It's just technology has moved around so fast. But if my iPhone breaks other than the screen, uh, it's, I'm really limited to what I can do to repair it. The only thing I can do is go and trade in and get a new phone. And that sometimes costs me a lot of money. Anyway, this uh, man up in Syracuse who had the cellular one also had a side gig. And he brought me in to see the giant computers that he had into this room that had this special argon gas that just, if there was any fire, it just smothered and put the fire out and preserved all the equipment. It's a heck of a cleanup cost, but that's what he had installed to make sure that his computers continued to work and his business kept going. So nobody would be out of service. But in the back room, he had 20 people sitting at workbenches repairing these dashboards that came in from every car maker, this is in the late 90s, and he was there repairing them, then testing them, then it would be called remanufactured, and he'd sell them back to the car dealer, whether it's a Japanese car dealer or American car dealer. So when you brought your car in and the dashboard wasn't working, no problem, they swapped it out and put in this repaired thing. They didn't repair your dashboard. They put in a repaired dashboard. They do the cell phones too. If you have uh, insurance on your cell phone, say send it in and bang, they send you one out, it looks just the same, but it's not even close to your phone. It's another phone that's gone through a repair service in a uh, certified repair shop. Uh, that's, uh, they have to do things according to the manufacturer. They can't just run out to the local you know, parts store and get a new transistor for you know, 27 cents and put it in there and fix your uh, phone. So anyway, uh, this is this man's right to repair thing. And I thought it was fascinating because he says we're being charged a ton of money for these minor repairs that we could and should be able to do on our own uh, electronics, our own um, machines, our own cars, etc. And I couldn't deny it because uh, I'm old enough to know when these things occurred that you could actually do this. And we we're building transition ra transistor radios uh, on our kitchen table uh, because we'd have all the parts and we'd glue the transistors in. And lo and behold, it wasn't as good as a manufactured one, but we could pick up Cousin Brucey and, at, at the midnight show on WABC out of New York City, no matter where you lived. It just seemed to bounce off the clouds and bounce to your uh, little transistor radio in your kitchen. So what does this have to do with horses? Well, it got me thinking, I don't want somebody repairing my horse. You know, other than someone who's qualified, who's been through the training, who understands what happens when you uh, put a knife through the skin and open up and see the bowel, you want to make sure that it's doing right. You want somebody who, who makes sure that what's happening um, with the bones, the tendons, uh, the GI tract, the liver, the brain, the eyes, whatever you're, you're looking at, you want them to be trained. And I, and I can't uh, emphasize enough how important it is to have someone train either as your veterinarian or as your personal physician, you don't want, you know, the guy down the street who is really good at fixing lawnmowers to come over and kind of fix your finger that's broken. Um, you need to understand principles and get good training and make it happen. So I'm not advocating that we have a right to repair our bodies or our horses' bodies. I do believe though that we have a right to prevent a lot of the diseases that we're seeing. We have a right 
to understand what's happening in ourselves or in our horses that will prevent future problems from occurring. Here's a great example, uh, brushing your teeth. You know how many people um, don't go to the dentist every day after every meal and have a dentist brush your teeth? You have the right to brush your teeth yourself. Um, in the horse world, we have a right for a farrier to come out and remove the excess uh, hoof that's on there. They're not supposed to be diagnosing. They're not supposed to be applying different forces. They're supposed to be just taking off the excess. Well, the line between the prevention and fixing is getting blurred every day. We start to have farriers who are specialists in quarter cracks or in laminitis um, or in movement for your sport. And they come in and they start adjusting um, angles and they start to quote unquote fix a problem um, through their craft. And some of them are very good at it and way better than most veterinarians. They don't understand the physics themselves. But it bothers the heck out of me that when I listen to farriers and veterinarians talk about repairing a hoof, few, if any, ever talk about the nutrition of the hoof. They look at it as, well, this hoof has been made. It's not continually, you know, regenerating, which is not true. Um, so let's just work with what we have and apply our rasp and our nippers and our shoes and change the angles and do this and that. And it bothers me that nobody actually looks at the nutrition of the hoof and it thrills me to death. <laughs> it thrills me to no end, I should say. When somebody comes back to me and says, you know, I tried the no grain, I added the soybean meal, I've been patient. And about four months after I did this, I started to notice that there's brand new hoof. And my farrier actually mentioned to me, uh, hey, I don't know what you're doing, but don't change your thing. I've never seen your hoof look better. So over time, and it takes one to two years to actually repair the hoof and make it strong again. So it can prevent the lamuses that are occurring, the cracked, uh, the shelly, the, the bowed out, um, deformed hoof wall, the crushed tubules, all these things that we're seeing in the hoof could easily be prevented if we knew how to feed a horse correctly from the very beginning, but we don't. We're late to the party. We come along, the horse is four or five, six years old, or maybe 10 or 15 years old, and we want to fix it today. So we hire the best veterinarian, the best farrier to come in to fix what's there in front of us. But somebody has to step back and say, you know, this is a minimum two-year project of replacing and repairing at a cellular level what's going on with the hoof. So I, I'm really on board with this right to repair uh, and I'm going to change it to the right to prevent. And we have a right to prevent these diseases from occurring. And I don't wanna put all veterinarians out of business and all farriers out of business. There's always gonna be a call for us. But I think everyone's wasting their time uh, trying to fix things when they could actually be preventing things from occurring in the first place. Imagine a world where your horse never gets laminitis or never gets a deformed foot that falls apart under the strenuous use of your sport. Just imagine. Imagine a horse that uh, doesn't shut down its sweat glands when it hits 90 degrees and 90% humidity. Uh, imagine your horse never having a suspensory ligament problem, but able the ability to move forward through these things uh, and accept the training that you're giving it and build on that training. Imagine if we could prevent all these diseases from occurring and moving forward. There's plenty of diseases that are gonna come out there. We have all the viruses out there. And I just listened to a great uh, podcast, uh, Zoom, actually not a podcast, a Zoom meeting featuring uh, three very brilliant people, one of which I know personally, Tom Divers, who's just an amazing veterinarian who's now retired from Cornell, talk about uh, liver disease and uh, the effect of uh, uh, viruses on liver disease, uh, causing liver disease. And I was just blown away, but there, there are viruses out there that we cannot um, stop. Uh, like COVID-19. I mean, that's SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-CoV-2 as a immunologist call it. Um, it's out there. It's always going to be there. We need doctors and veterinarians to help us through that. But what if we 
increased our chances to prevent that disease from occurring. What would happen if we built a foundation that was so strong that when we got these challenges, we survived them? What, you know, I, I know rabies virus, for example, I don't care how fit you are, if rabies enters your bloodstream and gets into your brain, you're dead. <laughs> I don't care if you're the most fit person on the planet. There are some viruses that are out there. Uh, if you get tetanus, uh, that's a bacteria that is going to kill you. And hopefully, if you're in great shape, it'll do well. Uh, I know that in 2009, um, through uh, instant accident that somebody uh, put me in a position of protecting her from being killed, uh, I ruptured a tendon in a shoulder and it, it didn't hurt. I just couldn't use my arm. It just like the cable was cut and it's just not going to work. So I elected to have some surgery done. It happened in uh, the very end of August and the middle of January. Uh, I got all my eggs in the basket, everything lined up. I was still working. Uh, it's a little bit difficult, but I adjusted and adapted. Uh, and then I said, let's have this thing repaired. And uh, it's the first surgery I've ever had. And I was able to have it repaired uh, and, you know, then packed a nice and, you know, all the recovery. And I went back from my recheck. I will tell you that I went to the uh, physical therapist. It's so funny. I went in there one time and she's doing this really wimpy physical therapy. And I'm like, what are you doing? She says, this is what we're supposed to do. She was approved by this uh, surgeon who had done the surgery. He had said that she's one of the best out there, you know, that I should go there and use this, this gal. And she looked at me and she says, you're not, you're not going to come back and do this, are you? I said, not from what I'm seeing. And I'm not seeing the point. So she gave me the instruction sheet and she says, go home and just do this. You want to keep the motion going. Uh, and I said, okay. And, uh, and I laid on my kitchen island counter. Uh, and my wife would do the physical therapy things and we'd be laughing so hard. I literally fell off the island. I was laughing so hard because it was just like, okay, move this, move this, do this, you know, and I get it. But then I went back for my, my uh, first follow-up with the surgeon and he looks at it and he's manipulating my arm and he says, oh my God, he says, this is incredible. Your recovery is just amazing. And I said, well, you know, I kept using it, right? I never stopped using it. I didn't do stall rest. And he says, it is so evident that you were fit before the injury occurred. The injury did occur. We repaired that. You've not ripped the, the, uh, the implants out of the, the wet cement, so to speak. And you followed the instructions, but have you been doing the physical therapy? I said, well, I went once, but I did some of it at home. You know, I keep moving it, but I don't stress it. He says, it's because you were fit that your recovery is beyond imagination. And he says, look, I just got a new ultrasound machine. I want to use it. I said, you can use it all you want, but don't charge me for it. And he just laughed. <laughs> he says, no, I don't think I will. And he used the ultrasound. He says, oh my gosh, the repair is going so well in your arm. And then he says, you're probably never going to come back here again. I said, I don't see the purpose. I, was just, I know what, what's healing. I know that I'm strong. I'm fine. And he says, okay, get out of here and use the back door. Skip the, uh, the front where you're going to have to pay for this. Just go out the back door. And I went out the back door. <laughs> True story. But it was because I was fit and healthy that I repaired myself. And this is what I'm trying to stress to you guys. If you could make your horse fit and healthy, then when it does get a virus, a bacteria, uh, let's say equine herpes virus, EHV1, that comes in and devastates you know, a whole uh, showgrounds, is your horse prepared to fight against that and win? Or is he going to fight and succumb because his immune system is so weak because he's inflamed and he has 90% of his immunity going to his gut, just trying to calm the inflammation down there? That's what this whole right to repair or right to preserve or right to prevent uh, health is all about. This is what helping horses thrive in a human world is all about. I'm not dealing in dashboards, cars, uh, computers, or anything that's mechanical. I'm dealing with a biological 
entity called your horse. And if you want to put in parentheses behind the word horse yourself in your own body, uh, my goal is to come before you as a 70 and 80 and 90 year old man where you're saying, gosh, this bunny's heart keeps ticking, you know? Uh, it's, uh, it's like the ever ready bunny. He's gonna be going around, keep pounding his little drum and keep walking on wearing cool sunglasses. Uh, if you don't know what that means, it's because you don't live in America and don't watch commercials, but EverReady is a type of battery that keeps on going when all the other ones die. Um, that's where I want to be. I want to live a health span. I want your horse to live a health span where he goes from birth to the day he drops dead and not have health issues in between. And that's what I'm, that's what this whole movement's all about. I, I've coined the, um, the expression, uh, your missing horse owner's manual. And the horse owner's manual is the thick manual that we used to get with all the cars and with all the other things. Now you just get a sheet of paper you know, with any governmental warnings on it. I mean, look at your uh, phone that came from Apple or Google or wherever it came from and uh, Android and, and you look at it and it's gonna have the super fine print of all the governmental warnings, but it's gonna have this, I don't know, cartoon where it says, this is where you turn it on, this is how you scroll through it, this is how you turn it off. And that's it. It doesn't tell you how to take it apart, to replace the battery, to, you know, uh, what could possibly go, be going wrong, how to clean your uh, lens so it, it can take clear pictures. You know, it doesn't, I mean, you can go to YouTube and start seeing these things, but you can't find parts. I mean, where do you find a part <coughs> to repair your phone or your car? I mean, there's auto pottery shops everywhere, but it's getting less and less, uh, you're becoming less and less able to actually go in there and repair. You just take it into a certified repair shop and repair things, or you bring your horse to the veterinarian and say, fix it, it's broken. And this is where the term whack-a-mole medicine came out. Whack-a-mole was a game where there's a board with all these holes and a mechanical device would pop up a, a mole, which is a small furry animal, and you would try to use your fast reflexes to go and bop it on the head. And that would drive it back down the hole. And then all of a sudden it would pop up in another hole and you go over there and bang that one. And you would, and the, the speed of which these things coming up would just be up and down, up and down, up and down. And you were busy going around trying to hit these, all these uh, moles that are popping up through the, the uh, uh, holes. You should get a YouTube video or some look of whack-a-mole uh, is is a crazy game that you know became iconic, and we see this in medicine, or in farrier work, or anything with horses. Uh, it's whackable. Oh, your horse has a sore back. Let's do this. Oh, your horse has a bad foot. Let's do this. Oh, your horse has an eyelid that's half closed. Let's do this. You know, and or your horse has a cut. Let's do this. And each one of them, we we attack and we don't look at, well, how fast is that cut healing? Why is that eye half closed? Uh, why is the hoof becoming deformed? You know, why would the horse's back start to ache? And we're not asking these questions. That's what the horse's advocate is all about, to ask the questions and dig down through the layers to get to the, to the foundation of what's going on. Horses have lived for 55 million years, they say. And that's a, such a huge number that even if we make it smaller and say, well, Homo sapiens have been around for 100,000 years, we say, well, we can understand that. I mean, I can actually envision $100,000 in my bank account. I can't envision $55 million. So sometimes these numbers become so large that we can't understand it. But horses have been with humans for only 4,000 years. At least that's as far back as our history books are showing a relationship with horses and humans. And it's not been since, I don't know, you know, America was, um, I don't know, what's the word I'm thinking of? Discovered? Uh, America's been around for a long time, ask any Native American. But the point is, the Europeans came over here in, uh, let's just round it up, 1500. And so from 1500 to 2100, which is where we are now, is only 600 years that America has been around. And of course, Europe's been around a lot longer. So is South America and Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, Asia. Their history goes back a lot longer um, than the migratory European that came over to America. 
but we used horses extensively for that migration and the discovery of different lands. We used nothing but horses all the way up through World War I. In, in uh, 1915, if you wanted to be an officer in the United States Army, you had to be proficient in riding a horse. That was just one of the requirements. If you couldn't ride a horse, you couldn't become an officer. Now, I mean, they, they have the horse's head for the emblem for the, the, uh, uh, the armored squad of the army, the, uh, the mobile armored squad, the tank commanders. I mean, they wear cowboy hats as a, as a, a tip of a hat, if you will, to our history. But it was in 1920 or so we were already getting mechanized things over into the battlefield. We had tanks, we had uh, not just horse-drawn cannons, but we had vehicles pulling cannons. So the horse quickly started to, to leave. Same thing in World War II, we had the Jeep that came out and replaced the horses for riding around. But there's a horse, oh, I'm so sorry, I can't remember his name. I wanna call him Bazooka, but, um, he got the Medal of Honor from um, the Marines and a statue, full life-size statue of this horse is there for the work that he did in the Korean War in the 1950s. And, and they used the horse in a way no other um, mechanized uh, thing could be used. Um, he would carry um, backloads of loaded ammunition to the front lines and they would give them give this horse casings and strap a wounded war um, man on the back, and he would come back riderless, uh, back and forth. He's he's true American hero, and you should look up his story. It's fascinating. Uh, again, uh, the Marines, United States Marines, have a full size statue, so you can look it up there. But um, that's the last time a horse was actually used. Uh, of course, we know a movie that was made of the Afghanistan war where uh, our troops got lost behind the, the lines and were able to escape using native horses and men didn't even know which end of the horse to get on. Uh, and they learned how to ride real quick. Uh, I haven't seen the movie yet, but it's a fascinating movie because they decided not to train any of the men how to ride. They said, look, just get on them. That's what these guys did and do your best to stay on. <laughs> That's how they filmed it. Uh, I really do want to see that movie um, in the very beginnings of the Afghanistan war right after the World Trade Centers were attacked. Anyway, um, I, I tend to digress on these podcasts, don't I? But I'm just trying to have a conversation with you. Uh, that I know it's one way, but I try to keep it entertaining so you can keep mucking your stalls or driving to work, whatever, and, and uh, not want to reach over and turn this thing off because I, I really do have some good things to say. But horses have been around for basically several hundred years in, in this American lifetime. Um, but around 1950, tractors became more popular and the interstate system started in 1959, 1960. Interstate are, are the major roads that we set up throughout the United States and they're called interstate systems. And it's really technically called the Eisenhower interstate system because he's the president at the time and he's the one who pr promoted it. And the whole purpose of the interstate system was to get our mechanized um, uh, troops to go from point A to point B in case we got attacked. If we had an attack in New York, we could bring troops quickly from Texas and Chicago on fast roads that were unencumbered by anything like traffic lights to get there. That's the whole purpose of the interstate system. And it's a military um, structure that they allowed interstate commerce commission, interstate commerce to occur on and finally cars. So in the 50s and the 60s, we started by cars. Now I was alive the late 50s and early 60s. I've been alive since 1953. And I've been able to see some of the horrible cars that they made and some of the better cars and the improvements. And now I drive a Tesla. <laughs> I love technology, don't get me wrong. I think it's great. But the horse hasn't advanced that fast nor is your digestive tract advanced that fast, your healing properties, your immune system. They're still ancient. They've been trained over hundreds of thousands of years to meet the problems that, are, that face it all the time. And when you have a horse that is being fed inflammatory foods, 
kept behind a fence where it can't find the foods it's trying to seek out, uh, kept in an environment that is stressful, such as loud music or loud fans that blow throughout the night. They can't get a quiet place to sleep. Uh, the floor is dirty. Uh, it's even wet and cold. They have no other choice but to lay down in it. Uh, they have an abusive groom or an abusive owner that either ignores them, doesn't feed them, overfeeds them, I think that's abuse, uh, overtreats them uh, or hits them or uh, calls them bad names. Instead of calling them by their name, they, they use derogatory terms. All these things are abusive and stressful to the horse. And that creates more and more cortisol in them that leads to more and more disease that they can't protect themselves against. Add that to the food that they're being fed and they basically fall apart. And it's our responsibility as a horse owner to develop this manual that's been missing on how to take care of them to help the horse thrive in a human world, which is the whole basis of the horse's advocate and why I'm gonna keep doing this. In my ups and downs of life, um, I can always come back here and say, you know what, I can talk about this. And a couple of things have happened this past week where I went to clients who I've known for a long time. These clients um, are literally one to two decades with me. They're getting all the material, they're getting the emails, they're getting everything, and yet, they don't spend the time looking at this. And last week I became so frustrated that one of my clients who's getting all the material started to cite to me all these podcasts that she'd been listening to. And I said, yeah, I listen to the same podcast. Yes, this is great. You know, this is amazing uh, material that we're getting about humans. I get it. But have you listened to my podcast? Have you read my material? And she had a blank face. I said, are you getting them? She says, well, yeah, I get them but she's not taking the time because I don't know what it is, how I can connect with people who don't wanna to listen to this. But maybe I'm asking you for your help. If you're listening to this, I would love for you to um, spread the word. I'd love for you to let people know that there's somebody out here who's not trying to make you your veterinarian, but is trying to create a foundation for your horse that your veterinarian has better success to work with and that you need to get out of the silos that everybody else is in. What I mean by that is everyone gets a silo. I'll, I'll give you an example. You have a veterinarian. Well, they're a silo, they fix horses. And within that silo, they're smaller silo, silos. I only fix broken bones, I only fix soft, soft tissue, I only fix reproductive problems, I only fix lameness problems, I only fix whatever. And they stay in that silo and they don't get out. You could say that I, my silo is equine dentistry, but I realized that that's a silo that was too confining and that there's way many more problems that we need to address because I've seen horses from, you know, all, in almost every state in the nation. I see these horses having the same problems and nobody's helping these people understand them and prevent them. So that's, I've gotten out of that silo. My silo is to fix horses. And by the way, I have another silo over here that's, you know, the Tesla, let's just say, or over here that's cryptocurrency that I'm trying to learn about, or over here it's, you know, fixing stuff on the farm. You know, it's, uh, we have interests, but I have no interest in cooking like my son does. Uh, I mean, he's a brilliant chef. Don't, I mean, he's just amazing, but I have no interest in cooking. It just doesn't throw me. I've got other things. I, I can only have so many silos in my life to address. But in the horse world, you have the chiropractic silo, you have the acupuncture silo, you have the massage therapist silo, you have the farrier silo, you have within the farrier silo, I only do quarter cracks, I only do laminitis, I only do, you know, uh, lameness problems. Uh, I only work with veterinarians. Um, then you have the other one that says, I'll work for almost nothing and just trim off your hooves. Everyone has their silos that they live in. And most people who own a horse says, I'm a horse owner silo. That's it. I'm not here to fix them. I've got the veterinarian. I've got the chiropractic. I've got the, um, uh, please forgive me, this horse psychic. I mean, they have their si um, silo. And some people reach out to that silo and say, hey, I'm not getting it with anybody else. I need somebody else's input to help me understand that. Well, I'm putting all of you who's listening to this in a silo called the Horse Owner's Manual. And those of you who are really interested are going to dig in and understand how the horse works on every aspect. And once you start understanding nutrition, for example, or teeth, or 
uh, how to clean the sheath without um, having to medicate them. Or um, gosh, you can pick almost anything else out of this huge number of topics that I've got. You can start digging into that. And what's really neat, when you become a member of the Horses Advocate and you see a topic that I haven't really addressed, it's either not on there or it's on there, but it doesn't have any material. You can reach out to me and say, Doc, there's nothing here on this. I need some help with this. Let's dig into this together. So we'll, we'll go and work on that particular topic and bring out some of the information or we just might hunch our shoulders and say, well, there's nothing out there. We're, we're kind of stuck here. And, but at least it'll be two heads thinking about it, maybe three or four or 10 or a, you know, more people thinking about it. And someone's going to say, well, what about this? Well, what about that? And that's the purpose of Horses Advocate and become a member. It helps us build a stronger and more detailed horse owner's manual. I hope this all makes sense. Um, I said I was going to start off uh, doing a couple of questions. I guess I'll do another podcast on that. <clears throat> but this uh, this right to repair really got to me this morning. My wife found it uh, as she was looking for something, and it, something led to something else, and it led to this guy. And it made me think that's what we're trying to do here. It's not a right to repair. I don't think uh, anybody should just do what they do. But um, I think they need to be trained. I think they need to have some insight. I don't mind somebody who's stuck in their silo who just does shoulder repairs to do surgery on my shoulder. I like that. But nowhere near, nowhere in there did he say, you know, your nutrition could really help this. You know, your nutrition could prevent this. A good exercise program using resistance bands could be something you can carry in your car and while it's charging in a charging station, you can get out and with everybody watching, I start doing my uh, resistance band training to build up my muscles to increase the glucose disposal, increase the strength and stability of all my joints. So when I hit 70, 80, 90, uh, I'm not the weak, frail man. I'm uh, very um, uh, strong and healthy. That's what I want to do. And it comes from resistance training and eating right. And that's the plan I do. And on the website, we have... Um, a forum called Fit for My Horses, which just allows anybody, and so far nobody's done except me, uh, to get in there and say, look, this is what I'm doing to remain fit. Because if I'm not fit, I can't assume that my horse is gonna be fit. It's a hand-to-hand -hand thing. So uh, in that forum, we can have some discussions on how you know, fat affects us and how diet affects us and what we can do to make ourselves stronger and we don't really go into how to because there's tons of websites on that. We're just saying, hey, this is what I'm doing and these are the results I'm getting. And I wanna be fit for my horses. So that's one of the interesting things about uh, being a member, we have fit for my horses. And we also have in-depth Zoom meetings. Um, these meetings, uh, let's see, the last one was on coat colors and it's all there on, under topics, but it's consolidated under one Zoom meeting uh, where people can ask questions and we can dig a little bit deeper, it puts it all together. Uh, we had one on the ins and outs of fats and how fat causes inflammation, how glucose causes obesity and how insulin resistance is a perfectly normal thing to occur. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with insulin. It's actually the continuous feeding of glucose and excess of the body needs for the day that's causing the insulin to do what it does. Um, next month is going to be um, how to drive... <laughs> how to ship horses. <laughs> and I know you're saying, doc, okay, you know, you're really stretched out of your silo there. I mean, you're a veterinarian. What would you know about shipping horses? Well, what a lot of you don't know is uh, I used to drive uh, big rigs for a living. Yes. Long nose Peterbilts, cab over uh, Max and Freightliners. And in our trailers were horses and we hauled horses all over the East coast. Um, and so I know a little bit about that. And I, do a lot of driving now. I do probably 60,000 plus miles per year uh, visiting horse clients. So I've got some pretty good ideas on how to haul um, horses and how to drive and stay safe. Um, and I'm going to try to put together a Zoom meeting that's going to be coherent and applicable. I mean, I could teach you how to shift a 13 speed fuller or 18 speed Spicer transmission. Um, and I might still do that just to impress upon you that I do know something about um, truck driving, but I uh, also know how to back up a horse trailer on a dime. Doesn't matter what length it is. Uh, I hope to teach you how to uh, use your mirrors 
or lean out your driver window and place your, your rear trailer tires exactly where you want them. Um, and other hints on how to keep your horse safe while traveling either to a horse show or over long distance. So um, yeah, it's a pretty diverse place to be, this Horse and Advocate uh, website. And I'd like you all to, if you haven't joined yet, uh, to think about that. Uh, yeah, there is a paywall. Sorry, um, I spent a lot of money uh, just trying to get this website running. Uh, I need to continue to maintain that um, thousands of dollars a month just to make sure all these things get out there. Um, and I also want serious people, people are willing to uh, put up um, and not just be a free for all like you find on Facebook. Um, but I, I promise in my next podcast, I'll get into the Facebook thing and uh, get some more questions out of there because a lot of them are good good uh, for discussions and uh, will help educate you here. All right, this is Doc T, I've said enough. Um, hopefully um, you stay to the end. All right, um, I'm gonna say I love y'all. Uh, I tend to say that a lot. It really means, I really mean it. It's not a, a superficial thing. I'm very grateful that all of you are here listening to this. Um, I pray that all of you uh, and your horses stay healthy. And I pray that y'all come back and help uh, horses thrive in a human world by filling in the blanks of this missing horse owner's manual. All right, Doc T out. We'll see you next week. Bye. Hey everyone, Doc T here. Thank you for listening to my content. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you please subscribe, comment, like, thumbs up, and give a star review? However it's presented to you, I want you to do that. There are two reasons. The first, of course, is to improve this product. This way I know what you like, what you don't like, what I can improve upon, what topics you want me to cover. But more importantly, it's also going to help others find me. And by doing that, you are now engaged in this mission of helping horses thrive in a human world. By you helping, we can reach others. And that I would be so grateful for. And remember, go to thehorsesadvocate.com for updates on this information. Thehorsesadvocate.com. And again, thank you so much for being here. Doc T out.